dear colleagues, friends, participants of this conference. Um, it's a gratitude uh, to be with you here today. And um, actually, it's a seventh conference of our conference, uh, Region, History, Culture, and Language. Actually, it's all about the humanity. And um, today morning, I was thinking how many presentations we had during uh, last six and even today with this seventh conference. And you know, uh, I counted uh, all the presentations and um, the result was the magic number uh, 365. Actually, it's the exactly number of uh, days during one year. So after tomorrow's day, uh, when the last speech will be finished, we will have 365 presentations during our seven years. So it's um, a big pleasure again to meet you, uh, to be with you. Uh, indeed, uh, being a humanitarian in a 21st century, it's a challenge. And uh, I think we are able to speak about that uh, we believe in different because uh, we seek for new ideas, different ways of thinking, uh, different and diverse approaches and backgrounds. Because um, being average is boring and uh, sameness sometimes is dangerous. We remember the times about the sameness. So um, today, uh, I think uh, we are going to celebrate. Uh, the celebration is about being together, sharing the ideas, and um, the history, culture, language, uh, those three backgrounds which makes us being who we are. I mean, Lithuanians, Latvians, Russians, Ukrainians, Polish. So uh, nationality is st still today very important despite uh, all the talkings about the globalization. And um, as I said, uh, we communicate honestly, friendly, and this seventh conference actually is um, very important in our world. Because, uh, I'm saying our world, I mean uh, the humanitarian uh, situation in Lithuania. And uh, as uh, Vice Rector said already, uh, it's some kind of uh, fighting uh, for survival, actually. Uh, but still, uh, I would like to thank to our team, to Humanitarian Research Center team, who participate uh, despite all the difficulties. And uh, I hope that today we will have very, very intensive day, uh, nice discussions, uh, questions, and uh, the friendly speeches. And uh, now I would like to ask to, to take a place, Associate Professor, from uh, Taras Shevchenko National University of Kiev, Andriy Rukas, and his uh, presentation, The History of Creation and Activities of Ukrainian-Lithuanian Student Society in Prague, Cozy city. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to be in Lithuania. Here in Lithuania, we Ukrainians always feel like we at home. Uh, that's why one more time I'd like to thank Simonas for bringing us the invitation to us here. First of all, I will make a short oral presentation, and finally, I will show some images, documents of. <coughs> Some material related to that uh, Ukrainian Lithuanian uh, student society that uh, functions in Prague. So, uh, in the history of uh, Ukrainian Lithuanian relations, the capital of Czech Republic, the city of Prague, occupies a quite prominent place. In the interwar democratic Slovak Republic, the Ukrainian Lithuanian student society functioned there for almost a decade. Uh, in this brief review, I want to point out only the main stages of the development of that 
society basing for various documents that uh, now are preserved in Central Archive uh, of Supreme Powers and Administration of Ukraine in Kiev. Ukrainian and Lithuanian students installed their contacts in Prague somewhere in 1927-1928, but only in spring of 1929 this contact uh, became quite intensive. Then on April 18th, the first organizational meeting of the society took place. It was initially planned to make uh, this society not purely designed for students, uh, but uh, they hoped to involve different kinds of people of different age groups. But finally, it turned out that only students were the members of the society. The impetus for the creation of this, of this organization gave well-known at that time, Ukrainian student Osip Yunik. On the Lithuanian side, um, Skuchas have to be mentioned first of all. Unfortunately, I don't know all these last names of Lithuanians. Uh, I tried to search the internet, but unfortunately, uh, no information was found by me about those Lithuanians who participated in, in that society. That's why I'm mentioning here only the names, only the last names, and I hope uh, for your help probably you will uh, assist me and uh, tell me who all these people were. So the first, A uh, Skuchas, I don't know the, the, the first name, just A uh, Scott Skuchas. Uh, the motivation to combine the efforts of two student groups was the Polish occupation of the parts of both Ukrainian and Lithuanian ethnic territories. The Ukrainians also pointed out another common enemy that was dangerous for two nations. I mean, the Soviet Union on the eastern flank. Besides, they expressed the idea to create a kind of a path between Poland and uh, uh, Russia. I mean, the path of neutral state beginning from the Vienna and ending with Ukraine that divide Russia and Poland. Uh, the Prague Society took as an example the organization of identical uh, society in Kowloon. It was the same Ukrainian-Lithuanian student society uh, operated in Kaunas. It was in Paul first, then was uh, that society in Prague, and finally there was the same society in Wien also. So in the uh, interval period, uh, there were three Ukrainian-Lithuanian students by first in Kaunas, second in Prague, and the third in Wien. So it was a kind of a network. Society. It was even planned to transfer the property uh, of the Prague Society to Kaunas in case of emergency if the Prague Society will have to terminate their activities. So they modeled their uh, organization, they modeled their activities on the Kaunas Society of Lithuanian and Ukrainian students. In early 1931, Prague municipality approved the char charter of that society. It marked the beginning of normal activity of the organization. The expansion of the society was closely associated with the name of its long-term chairman, uh, Dr. Metro Ravich. Uh, it's quite known Ukrainian philologist and musicologist and was quite active member of Ukrainian national. Uh, it was in this period when the society was, was most active. At that time, it numbered over 40 members. The vast majority of them were Ukrainian. In fact, it reflected the actual number of Ukrainian and Lithuanian students in Prague. Therefore, most members of the societies, societies uh, executive board were elected from Ukrainians. Also, the Lithuanians also had their representatives, but in the significantly less numbers. In December 1936, one of them, Dr. Akrainis, even headed the organization. The society was also headed by Konstantin Melnik in 1935 and Roman Fetchuk in 1938. Most of the Ukrainians also performed the functions of the deputy chairman. However, the secretaries were almost always uh, Lithuanians. The activities of the society went through without interruptions and it occupied its own place in a rather dense war network of Ukrainian unions in Prague. Incidentally, Ukrainian and Lithuanian students in Prague-based higher schools uh, had their own organization, but in this fact did not prevent practically the same people from creating a joint organization to create the efforts of both national groups. 
the executive work of the society paid a great attention primarily to the establishment of a friendly relation. Uh, not, along, not only among the young generation, but also among the seniors uh, of Ukrainian and Lithuanian nationalities who at that time lived in Prague. The administration tried to combine the events of a more respectable character, uh, for example, reports on history and current situation in Ukraine and Lithuania, visits to museums, exhibitions, theater, etc., with uh, entertainments. These attempts uh, really succeeded. Uh, it's necessary to say that the Czech beer played a remarkable cons consolidating role in that entertainment events also. The beer several times was, was mentioned uh, in the documents and the sources. So the Ukrainian Lithuanians uh, gathered in the pub and discussed some kind of questions they are mostly interested in and had some plans for future events. As I have already mentioned, the common political interests Sympa, uh, sympathies and anti-sympathies became the most important unifying factor for Ukrainian and Lithuanian students. The anti-Polish attitude of the society was quite obvious and always have been revealed. Uh, it worth mentioning that Professor Nikolas Brzyszka right, uh, was elected as an honorary member of uh, the Prague organization. He had it not only Lithuanian Ukrainian society in Kaunas, but also the Vilnius Liberation Union. This organization supported the Ukrainian nationalist movement, who struggled at that time was directed almost against the Polish imperial policy. It was this accent of the activity of Ukrainian Lithuanian society in Prague that raised concerns of Czechoslovak state administration, state authority. In autumn of 1934, it decided to, to deport from Czechoslovakia a group of active Ukrainian nationalists, including the head of uh, Ukrainian Lithuanian Student Society, uh, Dr. Dmitro Ravich, who was also an active member of the Ukrainian community in the Czech capital. He was forced to reside in Austria, and when he found himself in Vienna, he installed the same Ukrainian Lithuanian Student Society, but now in Wien. Uh, this action had a great impact on the society, raising even the idea to liquidate, to terminate whole activities. Uh, despite this fact, the society survived, but did not already have such an energetic activity as before. The number of its members was decreasing. Some people simply left Prague after the graduation of the high schools. However, even in the second half of the 1930s, the organization did not lose uh, the sense of its existence. <clears throat> even uh, there were several attempts to expand the number of members, uh, trying to involve uh, Belarusian students. Due to a small number of Belarusian students in Prague, at that time, this project, which uh, expected to utilize the experience of a similar three national society existing in Vilnius, unfortunately, these plans were ruined and Belarusians were not interested uh, to participate in Ukrainian Lithuanian student society. The public influence of the society, uh, despite the quite small number of its members, uh, remained quite solid. Uh, at the general meeting of uh, June the 1st, 1935, it was pointed out that the already mentioned Professor Brzyszka put uh, the Prague Society as an example for the Lithuanian youth in America. As a result, some 17 such organizations were created in the United States of, in the United States of America afterwards. At the same meeting, uh, it was emphasized that the mutual relations of the Prague students of Ukrainian and Lithuanian nationalities were at the much higher level than the relations of them both with the Czech students. So Ukrainian and Lithuanian students had much better relations between each other than they have with local Czech students. This interesting union of Ukrainians and Lithuanians existing on the foreign soil functioned until the end of 1938. Uh, and it was in that year when the society proposed to make a Ukrainian-Lithuanian textbook for self-study with an anthology of articles about both countries and peoples. However, this noble intention, intention was not realized because simply there were no one who could do this job because it was just an idea, unfortunately. Rapid ge geopolitical changes that swept the Central and soon also the Eastern Europe crossed out the possibility of further cooperation between 
Ukrainians and Lithuanians in Prague. The official date of the termination of the society's activity was June 30, 1939, but in reality it happened at least six months earlier. The society could not uh, continue its activities under the German occupation of Czechia and the absorption of Galicia and Lithuania by the Soviet regime in 1939-1940. For obvious reasons, it could not resume its activities in Prague even after the end of the Second World War. Uh, the archival materials of the Ukrainian Lithuanian Student Society, which are now stored in the archives of Kiev and Prague and possibly in Vilnius, deserve a more in-deep study, on the basis of which it will be possible to say much more about this interesting organization and its unifying tendencies of Ukrainian Ukrainian cooperation, which nowadays are very attractive and productive. So this is the finish of the text I would like to present. And now I wish to show you some images. Uh, here you see highly decorated uh, the letter-headed uh, paper that this society produced for some special occasion. Unfortunately, I don't know for what occasion it was painted. Uh, very well designed, very well painted. Uh, two coat of arms, one of Ukraine, one of Lithuania with the uh, Ukrainian Lithuanian flags, but uh, no date, no text. Seems to me it was specially designed to send some contribution. This is the first page of a uh, charter, that, which was approved by Prague municipality. This is the first page. Uh, it's in Czech, in the Czech language. So, Stanovi uh, of Charter. Ukrainsko-Litevskiego spolku v Praze, Ukrainian society in Prague, paragraph number one, spolek nazýva se, society is called Ukrainsko-Litevsky students spolek v Praze, spolek Ukrainian Litvinian student society in Prague. So it's just the first page of official document. Uh, this is the signature of the people who uh, submitted their application for approval. First is Dr. Dmitro Ravich. The second, Vitautas Bakutis. The third, Paul Pashkavitus. Omelchuk Yevhen. And Hritsi Vroman. Uh, it seems to be three Ukrainians and two Lithuanians. So these five people, they officially submitted the document to be approved by municipality. This is the example of application uh, to be a member of that society. Uh, especially for this presentation, I chose the Lithuanian application, so it's written in Lithuanian. You better read this text. Uh, much more, of course, there are much more applications from Ukrainian students than from Lithuanian students, almost. 40 applications, applications from uh, Ukrainian students and five, six applications. Uh, this is the same application, but it's already printed. It's already typed. It was uh, during the couple years of, uh, first couple years of the existing of the society, people, they had to write there. Finally, they typed. Uh, Interessant had just also filled, it seems to me, by the students. This is uh, the beginning of the list of the members of the society. The first is Petro Kozinski, second Petro, do, uh, Dr. Ravich, the third is Vashkavichus, Vashkavichus, Bogdanavichus, it's crossed because in member uh, finished, graduated from the school and left the Prague. So you see the names. Vashkevichus, uh, Bogdanovichus, Strib, Dr. Oleg Kandipa-Olzic, very well-known Ukrainian poet and hero, and the last and the last name of Ukraine. It's not the whole list, it's not the entire list, it's just 
the beginning of it. This because the paper, uh, the size was too big. And I did not put it in my presentation. This is the copy of the first letter that this society sent uh, after the organization meeting. The first letter, official letter of invitation, official letter of greetings was sent to the organization of Ukrainian National. It's in Lithuanian, but it's not an original letter. It's a copy that they made for their internal archive. And the second letter of greetings was sent to the Union of Vilnius Liberation. Am I right? Oh, Vilnius Liberation Union. Uh, it's in Lithuanian. Here is the letter that this society received from the Kaunas University in 1932. They had kind of correspondence with that university because there was even a Ukrainian student society in Kaunas University and they had a correspondence with the Prague Society. And here is the uh, invitation to the concert uh, made in Ukrainian and uh, Lithuanian language. Uh, also the part of that invitation in, in Lithuanian, in Ukrainian language, and in Czech language. Ukrainian, Lithuanian, and Czech language. And here is the program of that event in Lithuanian. So thank you very much for your attention. Unfortunately, it's only the beginning of my research because uh, this this presentation was founded on uh, was based on the documents that we have in Ukrainian archive in Kiev, and there are some documents in Prague, and I hope that there are some documents in Vilnius. Of course, if you find everything in the one paper, it will be uh, quite interesting text to be read in Ukrainian. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. And uh, actually, to be in time uh, for the second uh, presentation, we still have 10 minutes. So uh, probably it's a good idea to use uh, those 10 minutes for questions. I know it's hard to be the first one, but uh, anyone has a questions to Andre? I will have three actually, but uh, after uh, I will ask to, to say some information, my colleague with us. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear researchers, uh, on the behalf of Researchers Excellence Network, it's a great pleasure to welcome everybody in this conference and especially thank you, plenary session speakers, who accepted to uh, give presentations which will be transmitted online. So this uh, conference plenary session is recorded and uh, later we will share the link to this video record and you will be able to share with your students, with your colleagues and so on. I would like to remind that some people are connected online at this very moment, so please use your microphones during your speech. And of course, I would like to remind for participants online that they have possibility to give some questions for our presenters as well. So please write your questions in the chat line. We will give those questions after all presentation. So thank you very much for um, being here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you for as a plenary uh, session speakers. Uh, good luck for your speeches. And uh, of course, um, we hope for very good, nice discussions in all this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Britta. And uh, my promised uh, three questions, uh, which I was uh, thinking about during Andre's uh, presentation. So, so uh, the first one is you have mentioned three uh, organizations, uh, I mean, in Kaunas, uh, Vienna, and uh, Praga. Did those uh, three organization, organizations share uh, the same ideas? I mean, um, because Lithuanians, Ukrainians, 
Vienna is different uh, from Prague and Kaunas is different from uh, previous two. So whether they the same ideas? Uh, the second question is uh, because your, um, you are covering 1929, 1939. And my question is about 1938, about the Munich uh, conference. And have you found anything in uh, inner documents of uh, organization in Prague, how they reflected about the uh, Munich conference and what had happened uh, during after the Munich conference? I mean, especially because Ukrainians, I, I think they probably were are the citizens of a Polish uh, state and uh, because Poland took part of uh, Slovakia. And the third one, a little bit funny, uh, you, you showed us um, during the slides uh, to a language uh, invitations and even the applications to join. And I was thinking about it today and uh, what I agreed with myself that uh, I guess if today we had such organization, I think we would use one language, not sure which one, but probably English. But uh, back to those days, it was still a uh, dual language. So uh, please, if you can answer. Thank you for the questions. Answering to the first question, uh, the short answer is yes. They, they have the same political ideas. So this organization from Ukrainian side was a nationalistic organization. Uh, they support uh, they supported the organization of Ukrainian nationalists. Uh, probably they get some financial support from them. The first uh, Ukrainian Lithuanian society was uh, founded in Kaunas, and late in Prague. And when Dr. Ravich was deported to uh, outside the Czechoslovakia, he landed in Wien, and uh, in Wien founded the third organization. So it looked like uh, it was a kind of network of Ukrainian Lithuanian organization. It's just only my idea. It's not proven by the document, but it seems to me uh, this network was supported by maybe uh, maybe by Lithuanian intelligence, intelligence because uh, that um, society in Kaunas. Uh, the head of that society in Kaunas, he was the head of Vilnius Liberation Union. Plus, we know that the uh, Lithuanian state highly and actively supported Ukrainian nationalists. Probably that organization had some financial support from official Lithuanian authorities, but unfortunately, no documents have been discovered yet. I hope that I will be able to find something on that matter because he, in Kiev, there is nothing about the money. Just list of members, uh, minutes of the uh, meetings, uh, what else they have, the applications, uh, some kind of letters of greetings, some kind of official correspondence, but nothing about the money. Maybe it will be in Prague, or maybe I will find something in Vilnius. So uh, answering to the first question, yes, the same idea, very nationalistic, very anti-Polish, uh, it was quite obvious, and they do, and then they did not hide their their political conceptions, their political ideas. Uh, and the second question was uh, about Munich. Unfortunately, uh, I cannot tell you nothing about this because in the documents there is nothing about political matters. The the activity of that organization by the end of 30s it was very much declined. Actually, it was in the crisis because nobody was so much interested in that, uh, plus uh, the number of members was very quite small. As I've already mentioned, many people just graduated from the high schools and they left Prague, so they were no more active in that organization. That's why I, I do not have a straight answer. Of course, everyone had to react somehow, uh, but if uh, to say about Ukrainian nationalists, uh, they highly, they were highly involved in the uh, situation in Transcaucasia. So they volunteered for the paramilitary units. Uh, so we have to trace the, face, uh, the fates and the destinies of Ukrainian members of that organization. And if we do this, uh, we will find them fighting in the Transcaucasia military unit and later in the Ukrainian insurgent army. Unfortunately, I can tell you nothing about the Lithuanians. So the I need your help, and that's why I'm here with that presentation. And uh, the third question proposal, of course, 
uh, to communicate uh, now to communicate for uh, uh, for Ukrainians and Lithuanians, uh, we have to use English language. Uh, formerly, it was a Russian language, but uh, not popular anymore in Ukraine uh, and in Lithuania also. Uh, and, the, and the idea of such organization is, is very productive and very fruitful. It was 70 years ago, and uh, it's very effective now because now uh, Lithuania is regarded by Ukrainians as the most friendly state. Uh, several months ago, there was a so sociological civilian, uh, and most of Ukrainians, somewhere about 60 or 70 percent, answered the question, which country is the most friendly to Ukraine? Answer was this. That's, that's the good answer to your third question. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, for second presentation, I would like to uh, ask you to join me, uh, Kristina Bekere, uh, with her presentation, Committee for Free Latvia 1951-1960, Establishment, Main Activities and Cooperation with Lithuanian and Estonian Committee. Good morning. So we now have to travel to the United States and to the very high point of the Cold War. Yeah, we'll get that. So the Committee for Free Land it was one of the many, um, one among many Latin exile political organizations in the United States uh, who were devoted to the liberation of their homeland from the USSR and to the promotion and the restoration of Latin state independence. But this one, this particular organization is also very different from all others. And today I will try to highlight these differences, tell you about the establishment, context, main activities. Um, we will look at the time when the committees flourished the most, uh, namely from the creation up to 1960, when um, severe budget cuts ended the disaster period of war. And, uh, there are, of course, uh, several researches on the topic, mainly concerning the parent organization of these committees. Um, Latin committee has not been researched in detail at all, and my main sources for today's presentation are the reports, the committee themselves, the reports they sent them to quite a few people, and one um, presentable was the application of the United States, and they have preserved all these reports very nicely in their Latin state national archive. Uh, so, what was the Committee for a Free Latvia? It was part of an American anti communist organization named National Committee for Free Europe. It was later renamed the Free Europe Committee. Or, and it, was it was one of the very many committees in this organization. Curiously, the, the, the nationalities represented the such exile committees. This parent organization, Free Europe Committee, it was formed in 1949, uh, 49, and um, probably the most known initiatives of this organization is Radio Free Europe uh, in, in terms of exile political investment. But what needs to be said in the first place, and this is the key point, the very point that makes all this interesting, this organization special one, um, that um, in fact uh, all the efforts concentrated under the name of the Europe Committee was a secret United States government initiative, and it was secretly founded by the well, from the budget of Central Intelligence Agency or CIA. And at the time we are speaking about, it was, of course, not known. Um, here you see a piece from the journal Baltic News they published, and it quite nicely said what was known and what was thought at the time about the committee, which is a private initiative. Uh, but, um, um, in fact, um, um, yeah, the, the roles of the state, the U.S. state, uh, finances, all the things, it uh, became known only in 1971. Uh, 
The Free Europe Committee in its work followed general policy guidelines were set by United States uh, State Department and was jointly controlled both by EAA and State Department. But it had quite much freedom to act within these guidelines. And the Free Europe Committee was quite a big part of the United States Cold War anti-communist policy. It has been called uh, both an American weapon of the Cold War or, quote, the first major effort mounted by the government to oppose Russian hegemony in Europe. The aims and objectives of this organization are many, and they were quite complicated to explain as a structure. But mainly, it, uh, it goes up to two main directions of action. It is propaganda to undermine communist regimes and by firing resistance to the masses and loyalty to the regime. Um, as represented in the radio in Europe action. The second one was uh, propaganda inside the United States to kind of implement popular support for American anti communist policy. And this field was represented by the Crusade for Freedom movement. Uh, here you see some of the main uh, best known activities of this big free Europe committee. And so this organization addressed the very key point of the Cold War the ideological conflict and propaganda as the ultimate weapon of this war, how the Cold War was fought. Uh, but the aims of the organization also included uh, concern with uh, American domestic policy. Namely, it aimed to solve the problem of very large ethnic groups in Eastern Europe countries that lived in the United States. Already in 1944, there were around 1,000 ethnic newspapers in the United States and about 7 million people reading. Of course, when the refugees in the Second World War arrived, this number went up. So it was quite a large group, um, and um, they had quite a large group of uh, supporters, people who were uh, inclined uh, by their attitude. And this number was big enough to influence American elections, so influence votes. That is why it was um, important to somehow deal with the topic. And by the principle that um, when you are busy, you do not make trouble. This is one of the initiatives that was uh, uh, used to give uh, exiles a chance to somehow do something. Um, it also gave the, the best, best people, intelligent people, of exile a suitable employment in hopes that this exile situation would not be long. And um, uh, of course, the Baltic people were not by far biggest part of these exiles, there were the Polish people, a very small number, but um, um, yeah, the, committees, the committees were still included in this structure. And we still have to keep in mind that the committees were, Latvian committee we will be speaking about, is only a very small part of a huge, huge, huge structure. How huge it was is probably best thought by high numbers. This big Free Europe Committee received uh, from the CAA 16 million US dollars in 1952. Well, in 1952, the dollar was quite a bit more money than it is today. <laughs> so it is uh, really big money. And uh, the individual committees was around $60,000 per year. Also quite a big number at the time. So, Committee for a Free Latvia. It was established in May 1951. Under the name of Latin Consultative Panel, finished quite soon. And the committee was uh, comprised of seven members, one of whom resided in Germany, so could kind of supervise events in Europe. Estonian committee had five members, and Lithuanian committee had eight. What did the committee do? The field of committee activities um, is surprisingly wide. Here's, here you see them um, pinpointed. Um, I presume that goes also for Lithuanian and Estonian committees, um, probably differing in details, but the same in, uh, in general. There is, of course, quite a big um, amount of routine work they had to be do uh, they had doing all the time, meetings among themselves um, about six times a month, usually, speeches at different events to other exile communities, or interviews, participating in different meetings, conferences, um, social life like participating in the events by other committees, all kinds of congratulations, condolences, um, festivities of 
uh, national holidays, the daily correspondence, preparation of articles for propaganda materials. That's kind of a um, routine work that had to be done. Besides this, it must be noted that the committee was very active in information dissemination in all possible ways and means. Uh, they were really active in uh, explaining, making known what they are doing, among others as well, as well and what uh, the Free Europe Committee is doing in part. Uh, they sent uh, regular press releases and yearly activity reports to Latvian exile press. They spoke at different events in different um, exile communities about what they are doing, their activities. Um, quite they cooperated quite well with Latvian delegation in Washington. Um, yeah, the committee also had to prepare plans for future work, um, get them discussed with the to the European uh, Committee. Um, it is an open question still for me, how much um, was the policy of these single, community, uh, single committees influenced by uh, direction from above, from direction from the Free Europe Committee? It's hard to tell without the materials of the big committee itself, but it's sure that uh, there was at least uh, subtle guidance from, from above because the future plans had to be discussed, had to be approved to get money, of course. And um, yeah, they also, the specific committees also received uh, sometimes some specific things they had to do for the current organization. Um, the committee members were extensively involved in information gathering on Latvia. They monitored Latvian radio and newspapers to get them um, as much as possible. They collected information on agricultural, economical, political, cultural development in homeland. They also prepared surveys for this parent organization on a regular basis. And um, sometimes when they asked for it, uh, on the special um, Yeah, they also collected information uh, like hard indexes in Latvian intellectual exile. It's also quite a big part of their work. Uh, similarly, as many other exile organizations, they also prepared and printed anti-communistic brochures, materials, um, they distribu distributed them among exiles, um, uh, sent them even to Australia, these brochures. And interestingly enough, um, they had a, their own publication named uh, for the freedom of Latvia, Latvia Dreamy, published in Latvian language, and they managed, uh, since 1956, they managed to send this uh, four-page Paper sent it often by Latin. They sent it out from um, different addresses in different countries, um, targeting uh, uh, the Communist Party officials. How many of them did receive these uh, mailings? It's still hard to tell. But the activity went for, went on for several years. Uh, they also prepared regular radio broadcasts in Latvian for the Voice of America radio station that was translated from Madrid. And um, really surprising is the very wide field of social and business groups that they kept in contact with. The list of communication partners, it includes practically everyone you can think about. Um, you have, uh, of course, Latvian diplomats and central and local Latvian exile organizations. But you have also kind of youth organizations, relig religious organizations, Lutheran, Lutheran World Student Association, Baptist Congress, they participate in um, school and education related people, related people in Congress, they, Association of Latin Business, all kinds of anti communist organizations, trade unions, European movement, even Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, fraternities, even Latin theater workers were. Of included in the sphere of interest of the committee. They did not let anyone reasonable outside of the And um, yeah, we just mentioned youth, but um, one uh, topic that was really focused to organize the external youth, but it's um, a separate topic to discuss more at the time. And of course, they did participate in some um, important events that came happen. And one of such events uh, is the select committee to investigate communist aggression and the forced incorporation of the Baltic states into the USSR. 
it is better known under the name of Thurston because the Charles Thurston was the leader of the committee. Um, so the committee at the U.S. State Congress to investigate the matters as the name Paul name tells you. And the method, uh, how it was done, is a gathering of materials and hearing of witnesses. These committees, uh, both um, Estonian, Sweden, and Latin, were quite active to um, help find these witnesses, to help find materials, to assist the uh, Congress committee in their work. I believe Lithuanians were even more involved with the first committee and it even came to some rivalry in the topic that we now discuss. Anyway, all three commissions were involved. And so we come to the cooperation with Lithuanians and Estonians. Uh, inside this large structure, uh, structure of free Europe, free Europe committee, of course, cooperation took place among all the but for Latvians, it was, of course, the closest to Lithuanian and Estonian committees, actually. Um, they met uh, quite regularly, at least once a week. Uh, sometimes all committees, uh, sometimes the leaders of the committees to discuss or to make special policies. Um, and they also executed a few special projects, scientific projects. And one of them um, is Journal of Public Review. Uh, here you see um, there are examples, first 10 and 16 numbers. So um, the journal uh, was intended to offer reliable, scientifically correct, academically correct information on the Baltic states, the current situation in the Baltic states. Uh, the journal was prepared jointly by all the committees. Um, each number had its own chief editor. Um, these editors changed, sometimes Lithuanian, Latin, Estonian. Uh, the first issue appeared in December 1953, and um, it was continued up to 2021. Each issue, as you'll see uh, in the 10th and 16th numbers, each issue had uh, one uh, colorful band, so this one uh, special topic, uh, this um, issue was devoted to. And it is printed in a quite thick, very good quality book, uh, with um, which is important to note because there were quite a lot of exile publications, also in English language, that we wanted to see representation, to give uh, good information in all the states, but there were sometimes very poor quality. And of course, um, this journal was sent to US Congress members, library, all kinds of special people. And there is difference. If you receive a uh, nice journal, plastic paper, uh, correctly formed, uh, make you a better impression than pages from the print of the readable paper did not. So um, this is one of the very good examples of uh, exile family. Um, yeah, one other project, joint Baltic project was um, the purchase of uh, property named the Baltic State Freedom House in New York. It was bought in 1952 and just offered a place, a physical place, where all kinds of meetings could be held, social events, and uh, in the Freedom House. These are, of course, only a couple of uh, examples. Um, cooperation went on further beyond that. Um, such things like deportation day, commemoration ceremonies were, of course, organized uh, jointly and um, all kinds of smaller things. Uh, one thing that the Baltic committees were also concerned for a long time were the efforts to get Radio Free Europe to broadcast the Baltic states, Baltic languages. But they did not succeed in until 1995, so we will not talk about that. And the Free Europe uh, history is very well written as well. Of course, when uh, Assembly of Capital European Nations was founded in 1954, the committees um, and the Delegations to this bigger organization cooperated more in this uh, bigger framework, but um, we are only not here. So, um, to come to some conclusions, ah, here is still um, still the um, kind of um, you can see what was uh, in this about the review journal. Um, it's from the 16th number 1959. Uh, what kind of topics were addressed? 
probably you know or have a few of the names. But like uh, like Vaskola Svitikowska, who was the leader of this way in So to come to some conclusions um, and respectively, uh, retrospectively speculate what is the place role in this particular organization in the larger thing in the 1950s. One is um, that I already outlined, it was, course, it was of course part of a much bigger structure, the Free Europe Committee, which in itself was a integral part of the biggest picture imaginable for the United States initiative to contract uh, with the USSR. Um, but um, in terms, um, terms of the committees itself, we can come to a few conclusions. Um, I would even like to call them uh, presumptions, um, because to become conclusions, I still have to overprove them several times. Uh, but nevertheless, first it must be noted that Committee for Free Latvia had one huge advantage over all other committees in this time. From the very start, they had stable in the 60,000 around uh, US dollars they got every year. It was a big sum. It was not very often in external circles. Um, especially in the early years, um, that the money was available. Because um, the exile organizations, of course, only had so much money, as the exiles themselves would uh, donate to the organization. And in the first years, when you have arrived in the other country, and for yourself, um, there's not much you can donate to your organization. Uh, so the committee filled in this void place, this empty place, exactly in the years first years where other organizations were still forming um, operating efficiently. Um, the second um, thing that must be noted is that this bigger structure with the committees, all the stuff, it gave a platform for different nationalities, different exam nationalities to come together. This was a basis for getting to know each other. Of course, um, Baltic states, Latvian, Lithuanian, Estonian, um, probably would have cooperated with me because um, all the history of Baltic states in terms of uh, occupation and all things is so very similar that it does not make it doesn't make sense to pursue different kinds of three nationalities. But for countries like Albany, which was later part of the active European nation, there is not a any point outside the organization to think about to make Latvia cooperation. So this was one platform which was offered, contact offered uh, joint uh, right things to do. And this um, larger anti communistic context gave scope, it gave depth to the activities of the committee. They would probably themselves not, um, not become involved in so many circles in the United States. They would just. Um, people that they saw I think I know but um, this this large context gave um, that thing. Yeah how much it was a strategy from above? No. Certainly to a certain degree it was um, undoubtedly beneficial. I don't know. No. Um, so basically the United States government initiative to create such a mission, for whatever reason that arose, it was in a certain degree instrumental in uh, not creating, but more like structuring Latvian exile political war in the very beginning of the United States, uh, which would otherwise probably have been worse. It gave context, it gave depth, it gave uh, framework, and actually up to the 1970s, when the New process was helping again. Anti communism was the main scheme. You couldn't say that it all comes from this committee, but the committee, of course, is a very good, well financed start. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, we are short in time, so uh, I would like to ask you to leave all the questions to presenters at the end of this session.
And uh, now I'd like to ask to join me, um, actually, local, Vilus uh, Ivanauskas and his uh, presentation, Regional Nomenclatura and Bureaucratic Practices in the late Soviet Lithuania. Thank you. My presentation is about the socialism, some of the situation, especially the bureaucracy. So the city executive committee is doing a lot of efforts to attract more factories and organizations, city-based work. The deputy of Politus Executive Committee tells his job was local Ukrainian Soviet Lithuania. In this paper, I attempt to show the influence of regional nomenclature for modification of Politus to the sixth regional city of Lithuania. Showing them duty between the modernization task, participation in the Soviet camp, processes and bureaucratic performance, and maneuvering within the nomenclature cycles, at the same time ensuring the stability of the structure. So, theoretical background for, for this study is that we can see uh, in their situation that there is always formal and formal structures. Even in bureaucracy, bureaucracy is not only formal structure, but there is uh, of formal rules. Um, there is bureaucratic process to always cover every life of bureaucracy, and there is also social network around it. Also, there is some external organizations which have also they are uh, not only the formal uh, goals and expectations, but also some complex personal uh, expectations. So, here I'm using the insights of anthropologist Witten and Cohen. Also, of Stephen Thompson, who is looking uh, not only top down but also bottom up approach, and John Connell, who is thinking about social security and different structures that is important to look at the uh, social environment. And social environment, in my case, is very related to nomenclatura. So what is nomenclatura? Probably you already know, but I can remind us the Soviet nomenclatura is. Formally, selection system, the selection system of so called cadres and stuff. So, it's of keeping stuff in various establishments from party committees to different factories and team organization. Uh, so, the West, the West, uh, there were uh, different kind of uh, uh, levels of nomenclature. So, the West, the process level nomenclature. Uh, the West, 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 the West, the of regions. Um, so we can divide like in the West, the West, the West, top level. So uh, uh, only two persons belong to this top level. So there were secretaries, which are just part of the committee, and the council of ministers and chairman of parliament. Also, the West, then the West, Vilnius, Eating organizations like uh, freedom of writers and some uh, also he and some other uh, or divisions of central committee who belong to this also to high level nomenclature. And also the West of the Kulera level nomenclature were belong like executive committees, chairmen of executive committees in the cities or secretaries of perform cities uh, party committees. But at the same time, we can see the nomenclature not only as a as a very formal list of this selection system of this preservation of cadre, but also that there was lines of different branches. So there was nomenclatura members who were agrarians, and there was like a network agrarians who could be working with the, uh, the ministry, dealing with agrarian stuff, could be working with this uh, party committee, the city dealing with the, uh, with the agrarians. Uh, uh, issues and also the chairman of the and 
also the same logic was applied to different fields. You know, there, there was cultural establishment, there was food industrialists, there was lighting industrialists, uh, etc. Also, nomenclatura is very important that you can see nomenclatura not only as a formal structure, not only the list of these people, but also during the time it shaped as a social group. The nomenclatura was had its own ritual, so from uh, having common celebrations, to hunting, uh, they have this group was quite close. They, they were close from, from the society because with their privileges, with their privileged status, but also nomenclatura included not only the formal members of nomenclatura, but also families. So, but my presentation is not only about nomenclatura, but also to put nomenclatura in the regional level. So, I took the case of Alitus. Uh, so, Alitus is one of the modernizing projects in delay socialism. And we can see, uh, when we speak about this project, we can see personal relations between local party and managers. We can see the interest. And Alitus uh, described the situation of rapid industrialization and the urbanization of the USSR showing a particular city at the same time revealing the, their its potential and also the different problems related to the net of, of nomenclatura. So analyzing the locality factor of such historian as Stephen Hawking with his studies in, uh, of my Magnitogor city of Russia, illustrating how communist ideology were propagating local goals and requirements, but at the same time highlighted the momentous when local actors created their own routines when their not only commitment, but also interest, this sense from official goals and the culture, which is shaped on the ground. So, Alitus is very defined by, uh, by the late social uh, uh, project. Because it was developed very fast in the 70s and 80s. And the development of Alitus is based on the general scheme, which is prepared in IT. War. So this scheme, uh, the uh, work of such uh, Republican scientists as Meshkauskas and Zhukauskas, um, and, and uh, this scheme emphasized the concentration of industry in smaller cities, not only in Vilnius, but also in five other smaller cities, like uh, Alitus, Yurbarkas, but later Yurbarkas was replaced because of uh, oil company to Majeki, then Kapstukas, Utena, and Plungia. But Plungia was also replaced by Kelshe later on. And they expected that industry there should be developed very fast and uh, reaching about from 50 to 80,000 inhabitants. And the reason of this was uh, that it, it helped to, concent to avoid concentration in very few cities or one city, like in Latvia, and also at the same time was the strategy of the local of Ukrainian nomenclatura to avoid influx from uh, Russia, uh, work labor force. So nobody wanted to go to a small city. Usually the, those workers were from uh, somewhere from this district, uh, district of Sukas, so they were local labor force. And we can see that how many big uh, uh, companies were established during during the end of 60s, 70s, and 80s. So the Stratton factory, Midstand, refrigerator factory, experimental house building company, also factory of machines, wine factory, doing factory, and also some smaller factories. And also there was very big growth of the, uh, of the inhabitants. So in, in uh, 1964, there was only 15, more than 15,000 inhabitants in Alitos. So uh, during the 10 years, so it was already 40, more than 40,000. And in 1989, there was 79 uh, inhabitants in Lithuania. So, and during the last year of, uh, of Soviet Lithuania, Alitus became very near to the standards of other, of the fifth city, uh, so the number of inhabitants, the, the concentration of industry, and the achievement of modernization. It should be noted that uh, that this development of Alitus 
show some strategies of higher level women for sure remember was was one number uh, chairman alexander Rokin, was a person with some people person who supported the the idea to develop industry in the lead and a little thing from the culture cycle to a quote as uh, alexandria from sometime so his name was alexandra so alexandria or drobnyuk so in according to his name um and as a respondent remembers, Alitus had good support in the plan committee. Drobnis cared about Alitus and everyone, everyone respected him. The attention was such ministers were visiting Alitus and factories very often, almost every quarter. However, after the independence during 10 years, no minister was coming to Alitus textile factory. So when Drobnis was not anymore in his position. So as we see, there were some higher strategies of high level nomenclature according uh, for the development of politus. But then we need also to go to some ground level, to local regional nomenclature, which was uh, in Alitus. So local nomenclature consisted of city party committee members, executive committee members, and then managers and chief engineers of city factories, companies, and other establishments. So this city was ruled by city party committee, similar as the central committee at the Republican level, and cared about party control, evaluating not only the logical, but also sometimes bureaucratic decisions. So the executive committee cared about administrative urban work by organizing and involving companies into modernization projects, development of city, combining maintenance and the cultural issues. And the managers of, of uh, factories were caring about their own factories, but also they had some obligations for the city. So the local cycle also had very similar uh, social rituals as the high level nomenclature. There was hunting group, there was fishing group, there was some, some of them were fishing together. Also, the, it was important as a social group that many. Many nomenclature members were friends, and some of them were living in the neighborhood in the place near the center of Alitus. Uh, it's near the lake. Um, uh, so they have their own social rituals, and the children were sometimes uh, friends of nomenclature family. So you can imagine that the social group was um, was quite integrated. Also, there was some control areas among these nomenclatures, so part portocrats, so from party committee, controlled technocrats, or technocrats managed the resources. And they felt the control not only from portocrats, but also from the central executive board, so from ministers of Moscow or Vilnius. The party committee and the executive committees were pushing technocrats to ensure modernization of the city, and periodically tried to intervene in separate company management, ensuring party the city party and the executive committee's official expected that the company will contribute to the development of city, supporting schools, kindergartens, building cultural objects for poor facilities. Party committee had a right to apply party punishment for the managers who are, uh, who are breaking the rules, who are breaking party discipline. And the party committee had a possibility to harm the career of technocrats in, in some. Uh, in special cases. However, technocrats, as I said, managed the resources. Most of them were under the supervision of proper ministers. So it depends uh, what factory, uh, what ministry belongs. Is it all union level or is it the Republican level? Yeah. And this created more independence for, for technocrats in their bureaucratic performance. They, 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 at a certain level, were free to manage their companies uh, and to maneuver. Former Gospan deputy and former first secretary of the Communist Party, Albertus Brodowskis, remember that his friend Stepanovichus, who was director of Alitus Experimental House Factory, used his experience and contacts in Moscow and other republics to address successfully the supply issues. Former minister of food industry, Dulskas, remember that he, he, together with Alitus wine factory manager, Dukshis, uh, was caring about all unions level minister in order to persuade him to build technologies to expand the plant and start producing champagne. So there was a lot of private contact, some intimate 
is an intimate atmosphere. Technocrats could receive the support from outside. However, social and some infrastructure regulations were directly dependent on executive committees, so their managers had less opportunity to maneuver. Technocrats also could provide blood links, so personal, or personal uh, blood or supplying the resources to the, um, to the particular establishments or to uh, other local nomenclature members. For example, managers helped to the city authorities to receive the necessary goods and receive the deficited materials. The status between directors were not equal. There were more important cadres and less important. For instance, the status of director of experimental house factory and cotton factory were greater than their others because they belonged to the all unions level. Their factories belonged to all unions level. Regional nomenclature members at certain level had shared responsibility to go via Paruka. So despite the internal control, there was wide sphere for negotiation and mutual performance. The, the dual control of ethnocrats influenced that the bureaucratic performance belonged on rather negotiations between partnocrats and implementers than on top-down regulation. And this negotiation sphere was important, ensuring appropriate level of modernization, avoiding internal conflicts, avoiding external controllers uh, who are checking the progress if there are no mistakes, and ensuring the stability of nomenclature network. However, the leadership of Vice Secretary of Perform was very important too. So in the 70s and beginning of 80s, the chairman, uh, the sec Vice Secretary was Panavichus, who were, was more engaged in team methods with nomenclature members, but then uh, the, another uh, press secretary, Gennady Konoplev, came. He was more authoritarian uh, style uh, leader. So there was some conflict between and tension between nomenclature members. And then there was a Russian uh, press secretary, Nikolai Rybakov. So he uh, had less support among local cadres. And uh, he was less, not only supported, but less respected. Uh, and the way this Krugovaya Paruka was, was more intense because some other, there was more uh, consolidation between executive committee and uh, technocrat. The image of social times and mutual commitments of Polito City allows us to speak about one interesting thing about the uh, about the bureaucratic performance, about bureaucratic routine. So this process of modernization is relevant not only for implementation of the different goals, but also relevant for the networks. And during the late socialism, we can very clear, and when we're looking at the local level, we can very clear identify some informal, specific Soviet era bureaucratic culture. And I tried, I analyzed it, how decisions were made, how they ruled the companies, how what were the conflicts uh, between them, and how they managed to solve these conflicts, and how they managed to uh, solve the uh, shortage of the goods or shortage of the raw materials. So I, I, uh, I tried to distinguish several routines, practical routines, which uh, explains the logic of the formal culture of uh, uh, local nomenclature. The first routine is don't break relationship under any circumstances. So nomenclature members could have opinions about two ambitious plans, implementation, insufficient allocations of resources, or the appointment of specific persons to responsible position. However, there was avoidance to face the open confrontation with the superiors, colleagues, because this, this could have a negative impact on the career. The more it was unwilling to have the enemies behind the back. And these, those persons who were too ambitious and who were seeking justice were usually racing to be moved to a disadvantaged position. Agreement and negotiations between nomenclature members was more pronounced than conflict and harsh debates. Second routine is constant maneuvering. According to the respondents, the logical strategy was to maneuver it, to seek informal access to a specific decision maker using personal ties to drive to solve raw material plan implementation of career issue. 
the head of the factory remembers how he went to Moscow with the gifts. Maneuvering could also help to diminish the technological requir requirement. Respondents remember the moment when various commissions were coming to his company. He said that the inspectors would always find, coming, find something to catch up, so they needed to show specific attention. Quotation, we didn't need to drink in the commission. We took the risk, the risk and controllers came, comes, necessary to spend time together in the restaurant in the evening or in the sauna. There were many technical inspectors. They were able to solve the problems in both ways. The girl with brush nails was able to stop the duct. So the lack of resources mentioned by the respondents was one of the major obstacles to implement the plans. The way of acquiring the resources were often relied through personal relationships, finding solutions to ministries, work plans, and other responsible organizations. Also, what I found that there was a lot of imitation of indicators and activities because there was uh, this, this Soviet system um, that a plan and the plan could not be considered. And it was sometimes very difficult, difficult to discuss the set goals and objectives. And this was especially true for manufacturing and services organizations. Another, uh, on another hand, it's evident that there was a certain understanding between executives and planners that the plan could, not, could be sometimes not fully implemented for some reason or could be the results could be improved in some ways. Um, so uh, they mentioned that there was various methods for calculating the results. Alitus Vice Secretary Gennady Konoplov so supported the idea for proving the results. Another respondent remembered the situation when the press secretary ordered the chairman of the collective farms to increase the amount of milk in the results. Uh, the same fact was mentioned by the Central Committee Secretary Vito Kosostrausos, who was controlling agriculture, saying that information about such press secretary steps later reached Vilnius, but no radical measures were taken because of unwanted noise and the fact that one of them had good relations with the patrons in the Venus party structure. So sometimes these typical different teams combine together. These don't break, uh, don't make that relationship help also to for the, proving the results. And similar, similar tricks were possible implementing plans demonstrating good results that could have an impact on both the party committee and the leaders of the organizations themselves. This observation also drew attention to how local party committee and the leaders of the organizations themselves. This observation also drew attention to how local awareness showed how to get around the situation so that the city performance would be good and that it would be not, it would not come. The, uh, if the respondents uh, remember different situations when it was possible to complain about such instruction, instruction as the responsible party committee's official had a higher level of contacts and could find more than one way to hurt the opponent, unless the latter had a very strong support. One respondent remembers that one chairman of Alito's organization had direct contact in central committee and could avoid the pressure from party committee, but this was an exception. In essence, such simulation strategy illustrated the demonstrative character of Soviet system in which the form had a preference over the content. So it, I see this metaphor, the strategy to find the form of uh, the ruling of form as a key uh, bureaucratical routine under the Brezhnev style establishment, which was dominated until the breakup of Soviet Union, despite the Gorbachev reforms. So also there were some other bureaucratic strategies but these strategies show very, very important um, situation that there was modernization, there was uh, a lot of support uh, from different levels uh, of nomenclature to this uh, modernization. But when we look on the ground, there is always a lot of the possibilities to escape formal rules and to work for benefit or for harm of uh, some planning processes. Sometimes it uh, had positive, this maneuvering had positive results, helped to access uh, raw materials, but sometimes it's hard to come to the bureaucratic performance. So thank you.
Thank you very much. And uh, as we agreed uh, before, uh, all the questions we will leave uh, at the end of this session. And now I would like to ask to join uh, the last uh, participant of this plenary session, Ilga Shuprinska, and her presentation of Guardian Literature in 2017. Thank you. I am pleasure to be here uh, and tell you about situation in Latvian literature. Uh, more or less, uh, but I uh, speak about these two books. Maybe I give you. Sorry, sorry. Maybe I give you, and you can see, and maybe try read some text in Latvian, and maybe uh, uh, find some. Uh, words uh, which are so similar with Lithuanian too. So, uh, I will start with the review of uh, an ed educational computer game. First of all, because the game is devoted to a little known and unreservedly forgotten fact in Latvian history that is a resume on. 27th and 28th April 1907, old style, the first Congress of Lago took place. And the idea about the unification of Vidzeme, Kurzeme, and Lago into a one state emerged for the first time. Secondly, the 33 chosen persons who carry out their talents during their lifetime and contribute to the development of Lago, Latvia, and Europe are a vivid example of Latvian otherness and its multicultural environment. The heroes of the game uh, are newly chosen from the time when the first Latvian writers appear, and Latvian Latvian self-confidence is threatened. Thirdly, also to rouse the interest of the students, different fields of art and the most prominent representatives of science were included in the game. It is dominated by people from literary sphere. Of the 34 persons, 16 represent literature. Before I give the definition of Latvian literature and speak about the difficulties of its development, uh, there is a slight insight into the structure of the game. The basic principle of the game is time machine. The player travels with the historical personality during his lifetime from 1870 to 2005, stopping the events in one of the brightest years of his life. The unifying factor for all heroes of the game is the birthplace of Latgale, as well as the fact that their lives and work are, are already over. Uh, if you see, the structure of the uh, game uh, is developed uh, and uh, edit with five mini games, but uh, I don't have time to uh, speak about the mini games. Sorry. So let's focus on the uh, 34 uh, three, uh, historical persons and the definition of Latvian literature. The surnames of the historical personalities highlighted in blue are those who wrote in, uh, wrote in Latvian. Surnames in green those who could speak Latvian. The overall picture is quite horrible for the Latvian language and literature. At the same time, best known in the world are those who have remained unhighlighted. Yuri Tignano, Mark Rotko, Hertz Frank, slightly less known Jans Ivnos. Also, his contribution in music is really appreciated. Rainis Jans Blikšans is highlighted as a person who knows the Latvian language. But during his lifetime, he wrote only a few poems in Latvian, and he used the Latvian language to translate Faust. Philosopher Robert Mooks, who lived in Germany and the USA after World War II, has four poems in Latvian. He wrote philosophical works in English and poetry in the Latvian literary language. Also, uh, a knowledge of Latvian identity as his own. 
Stanislavs Lovisons left for Europe uh, to obtain higher education in the field of clergy. But after the war, he was not able to return to Latvia. Later, he wrote his main works in Portuguese. Uh, namely, the development of the Latvian literature can really only take place after the Republic of Latvia was formed in 1980. At the same time, the course, uh, consequences of the Second World War have influenced the authors from Latvia who write in the least two languages and most often refuse to use the Latvian language. This is only logical because at school the Latvian language was taught uh, as a subject only in the 1920s, until the uh, overturn organized by Carlos Ullmanis. Several studies also show that Latvian are not the most active readers. As a result, there, are, there is always an on, ongoing discussion about Latvian literature. If there is literature created in the Latvian language, it can be perceived as independent literature. It can be perceived also as literature depicting Latvian themes. In the latter case, it is an integral part of Latvian literature because works are generally written in the Latvian literary language. Obviously, there are separate periods when authors have written only Latvian, but these are short periods of time and there are not many such writers. The question uh, about the uh, Latgalian language and culture appear in Latvian mass media from time to time. In May 2017, the Centenary Congress of Latgal took place in Rezekne. That actually like the question about the status and functionality of the Latgalian language. Let uh, us focus on brief insight uh, in history uh, to Latgal. From the 17th century till 1917, Latvia region has had different historical development than other regions, Kurs and Vidzen. Besides, the dominant religion was different, Catholic, as well as approach to social economical questions and languages. The Latvian languages was developing rather fragmentary because of many print bands and limited languages usage at school. Several times, the Latvian language was marginalized for political reasons. And you can see uh, these periods in which uh, we uh, don't write uh, Latgalian. It is Russian Empire period, it is a period during the First Republic time, and it is a period during the Soviet time. Uh, modern Latgalian has its own ESO code, standard code, LTGA, uh, since 2010. In contemporary official Latvian texts, no expression even appears that would suggest the status of the Latgalian language as language. It is always called Augsburg dialects upon uh, upon dialect. Official language law determines that, uh, and it is called. The state provides maintenance, protection, and development of Latgalian writing as a historical type of the Latvian language. So. Then my question, uh, is Latgalian literature of the second decade of the uh, our century an independent regional literature, or it is part of Latvian literature? Uh, the rhetorical uh, question persists. Uh, the answer depends largely on whether the Latgalian language is perceived as a variant of the Latvian language, a different and standard and grammar system, or only one dialect of Latvian language. Uh, this can be verified by answering an elementary question. How many publications during the period of Latvian independence have been issued uh, in Latgalian or bilingually? The answer is only approximate because uh, as there are currently no statistics about books published in Latgalian or bilingually. When applying for ESBN or ESSN code, it is impossible to record multiple languages in the language section or to show that the book is published in the Latgalian literary language. Uh, it can only be recorded in the descriptive part that is not taken uh, into account when creating statistics. Consequently, such a review should be made manually. Uh, if you uh, 
uh, see all publishing houses or uh, all uh, authors who, read, uh, who write uh, in Latgalian. Here is, uh, here is comparative summary uh, of the number of books published in Latvia and by the publishing house of Latgala Culture Center. It should be noted that only 2005 books written in Latgalian were mainly published by Latgala Culture Center Publishing House. Then Latgala Culture Center Publishing House turned to the old orthography, and most of the younger and middle-aged uh, authors sought cooperation with other publication houses. Scientific publication in Latgalian, including literature for children, since 2008 are published at Rezekne Higher Education Institution, since 2016 at Rezekne Academy of Technologies. Uh, I will now uh, discuss the achievement of uh, 2070s. Uh, I have uh, two slides, three, both. If all 17 publications were in the Latgalian language, it might be said uh, that this is not much for the development of independent literature, however, there is development. But once again, the bilingual names of the works uh, are colored in green. The Latgalian language prevails in the book Gostos Pibonyuka, but in the audio books of uh, Ing Abel novel Klug Mux, uh, only uh, some words is in Latgalian. In blue uh, is Latgalian publications. Then it uh, comes to five, ten books a year. In addition, they don't know uh, enough readers' attention and literary criticism. Often uh, the assertion uh, of receptive uh, aesthetic that the book has not taken place is attributable uh, to Latgalian literature. It happens because writers, reviewers, and most active readers know each other well and support book editing and publishing. Uh, one of the problems hiring the processes of legalistic in general, as well as the development of literature, it is uh, uh, flow between the porters uh, of old and new uh, Latgalian uh, orthography. Uh, without going into linguistic nuances, it can be said that the main difference is the words written in the new orthography more uh, precisely reproduce speech. But one of the most serious reasons for the dispute is the dicton O, Ua, uh, which is represented in the new orthography like in the Lithuanian language. Of course, uh, the polarization of target audience is never sharp in all cases, but basically it is rather close in the real situation. Uh, the annual culture prize Bonux was established in uh, 2008 since then, it is a reference point for literary works too. Literary work in Latgalian or about Latgala can be found in the competition application. And it must be admitted, there has not been a case in all this time that the title uh, of the best book or literary achievement has been awarded to someone who continues to use the old orthography. Uh, among the winners this year, uh, there are two books that are directly related to me. Poet Ribes, uh, the real name Oscar Orlos, has published the first collection of poetry before the uh, two prose collections have been published. I am the literary editor of this collection. The other book, Dostos Pibonikos, Dosti Barnim for Latgoli, Visiting Bonyoks, uh, is a fulfillment of my ideas in cooperation with poet, teacher, and drum therapist Lady Rundana and teacher Alec Andreeva. I am really pleased that Oscars and Liga have been my students. Pistacies, ironic and ambitious, is very name of the book. And firstly, pistachio nuts, which are absolutely unusual of the Latvian climate. Even more, they don't associate with the mentality uh, of nine not sitting on the bench. This small detail, which is also highlighted in the visual presentation, provokes to think about whether the changes that occur in individual in society allow the lyric hero more towards the perfection of self. Secondly, the statues. A proposition with a known right together mean uh, existence. 
the leading motive of the collection being on the way uh, to oneself, one's home uh, and values. And thirdly, the phonetic aspect of the word, especially pronounced in Latgalian, Pistacis, uh, which is softer like Lithuanian, suggests the process that after fraud is often sublimated into various forms of art. The book also has a quest for law. Unlike the Soviet era, uh, where there uh, was no sex, here it is felt, mostly in the sonors, epithets, and metaphors. Dostos pie Boniukas tosti par Latgala bārnim, visiting Boniuks stories about Latgala for children, is book uh, that is partly focused on solving the problem of uh, uh, reluctance of to read books of my uh, 10 years old son. Namely, uh, it is an interactive book. Uh, one can write in it, do various tasks or play a game, and one can also read in dialogue. It is quite colorful and informative about Latgala. People from other region of Latvia come to village um, of Bonyuks, who has became a culture sign of Latgala, even a concept in Latgalian literature. Anna from Zemgale, the childhood hero uh, of Anna Brigadere, Pastorinč from Kurzere, uh, Kurzeme, uh, the hero from story uh, Business Upeitis, and the det detective Uga from Vidzeme. Its other uh, is talent uh, Louise Pastore, who has written a series of art detectives for children. With the help of his family, uh, Bonyuks introduced his new friends with his family, his neighbors, Latgalian tradition, the most significant geographical and cultural objects, Latgalian authors uh, of literature for children, and Latgalian symbols. As we write in the introduction of the book, we try to look from a different point of view, so the child does not get tired from large amount of information, so that uh, he can understand and experience it forever without your uh, parents, teachers, assistants, encouragement and creation of new thoughts, emotions, readings, enjoying of this book will hardly be possible. The book is also helpful for teaching lesson in local Latgalian studies. A course of Latgalian studies is a subject that should be introduced to South Latvia in order to raise Latvian self-confidence uh, and build a strong ter ter uh, territorial affiliation. Currently, this subject is taught only in several schools in Latvia in Latgale. The reception uh, of those books is a contemporary person who is formed as a person who understands the Latgalian language. In the case of Pistacis, is already living there in Latgale and living in the Latgalian language. And maybe some small conclusion, my friends in Latgalian literature. Uh, we have many factors that uh, hinder the development of Latgalian literature, and you can see many from uh, them. But uh, one, uh, it is uh, status and functionality uh, uh, our language. And uh, you can see many writers, uh, for example, Anna Ransan, Anna Kmilek, Ingrid Karaude, choose to write bilingually in Latin and Latgalian. And one of the reasons uh, is the lack of readers in the Latgalian language. Uh, and these two traditions, Latvian and Latgalian, is not the same. Uh, it is different. And I would say, uh, if uh, other uh, writes uh, in two, uh, languages, then Latgalian is tradition. But if uh, others write in Latgalian in general, then uh, this uh, is uh, very uh, the same with uh, global process and with process in literature uh, in general. However, the most popular genre in Latgalian literature is poetry. And the uh, representatives you can see on Ransana, Jungs Rilchans, Ingrid Tarod, Anit Milek, Ligi Purinash, Lee Grundan, Ina Tatil Yugane, Raibis, Valentins Lukashevich, etc. Stories uh, and social comedy. Uh, and if we speak uh, about Latvian uh, authors and Latvian uh, literature position to Latvian, then you can uh, uh, read this uh, last point. point. 
In the history of Latvian literature, uh, when evaluating literary processes, the Latgalian literature is not mentioned at all or viewed in a separate chapter, which, from one side, uh, testifies to the fact that the literary tradition is small, and it is difficult to distinguish, for example, trends. From the other hand, it, it, it draws to be a separate literature. So, for this preview, in, and if you uh, are interested in Labgalian Lab literature, you can uh, see this information. Thank you very much. And uh, with this presentation, actually, we have finished our plenary session. I mean, uh, the presentation time has finished, and now we have still um, 12 minutes for uh, your kindly questions to our presenters. Is there anyone who would like to ask those four presenters? No one. Okay, yes, sure. Sorry, I had a question for the last speaker, Ilga. Where exactly, uh, what, was, what I was missing during your presentation, where was the scientific evidence for the need for Latin language, language and second language and Latin schools, et cetera, et cetera, due to the fact that uh, I didn't see any surveys or at least any media outlet speaking. Uh, you proclaim as uh, someone from the academy. Uh, is it something you propose as an academic or academy or Sorry, question. It is academic point or uh, it is what point? It is academic point or Uh, which fact you mean, uh, develop uh, literature or uh, my uh, opinion about language? Uh, no, no, about literature or? Okay, uh, I quote, I, I quote uh, a law uh, our state language. And uh, you uh, heard this text, yes. Uh, and uh, in international level, uh, we have uh, for Lablalian language this uh, uh, ESO code. And international level, uh, Latgalian language uh, have all features uh, which uh, is uh, necessary for language. And uh, for example, uh, you can read uh, uh, Latgalian grammar Nicole, no, for example, it's academic level. So, but I have a question for you. Uh, you speak about the bureaucracy. Uh, how is the situation in Lithuania today? Because in Latvia, some, some models from this bureaucracy is very, very I didn't make research about bureaucracy nowadays, but I myself, I worked a few years in bureaucracy. And also I can read the newspapers, so what is happening from like a public procurement, other. There is some inherited, inherited uh, routines from Soviet time. And like a local network, a very, very, in Lithuanian municipalities, it's very important to understand that these power structures just around municipalities who are the main directors of different uh, companies, how they relate also with the municipality, different clans. And I mean, there is some analyst, uh, analysts who are saying that uh, uh, very, the corruption is coming from the clans. So 
Uh, my study on so on late Soviet show that some of the teachers were inherited some of these plans and the logical plans um, and also the bureaucratic rules, formal rules, how to have good relationships, how to uh, have some performance and how to maneuver. So important. But also there is some new some new rules are coming. I, I would say that there is secret. That there is new and old. New meet old and uh, shape shaping the new that, that some some of the things remind me. Was Soviet system was a system when there was lack of everything. And also lack of motivation. So we can imagine how sometimes creative people need to be to access something. But also, they also wanted to remain stable structure. So in order if they not perform. So I would say that my personal experience when I walked into the rock, um, I observed, I, I didn't speak about this last routine, it was for a short of time. So the paper must lie a little bit, stay on the table. So that I, I I saw that there is some similarities nowadays that sometimes bureaucrats want to know all the circumstances if the boss, if the, some, or the chairman from other division uh, will not be happy about the decisions and uh, they want to not risk putting the agenda. So sometimes, sometimes I don't know how to in English in Ukraine and there is uh, a word of Skrudeli Shkuma. Yeah, yeah. So, so this bureaucratic checking still is relevant now. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have more questions for participants? I guess uh, this is it uh, with our plenary uh, session. And now I would like to, uh, to tell some. Uh, information from the uh, part of our uh, organizers. Actually, uh, we're going to our uh, lunch break uh, now and uh, we're waiting for you at uh, 1.30 uh, p.m. Actually, uh, three sessions will be held here on the fifth floor. Uh, the rooms are uh, 4.11, 4.12, 4.13. <laughs> Those are, are going to meet the historian sections and uh, culture and uh, linguistic uh, will be held on 215 on the third floor in the same building. Um, the lunch time is uh, quite long enough, uh, one and a half hour. So you will have a uh, pretty much a time uh, not only for uh, lunch but for a uh, sightseeing of uh, Shirley uh, City Center. So have a nice time and bon appetit. <laughs>